Welcome to episode 14 of the Rex Chapman Show. I'm Rex Chapman with the super cool, super sexy, super humble Josh Hopkins. Hello, Josh. Episode hey, you forgot, you forgot 15? super buff. You forgot super 14? buff. Super buff and super duper. You forgot super duper. I did forget super duper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, A lot of people don't know I'm the first super duper model. Yeah, and you were super models. I'm super duper. Super duper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you spell duper? How are you spelling duper? Here's two two O's or a U. I go with a U, and sometimes I'll put like a two dots over it, like just for no reason, like kind of a German thing or something. (laughs) Duper 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 model. (laughs) (laughs) So we got some happenings, and it uh, in the in the league recently in in coaching. and oh, it involves goodness. a good buddy to you of yours you've talked to. So Danny Ainge is is leaving uh, leaving Boston as the GM. Daniel uh, Ainge, you you spoken to him? That was kind of out of the blue for me and most people. What do you have to say about that? It, it was out of the blue for me uh, in a sense, in that I learned about it when everyone else did. I've had an inkling for a while that <laughs> I don't know that Danny was going to switch up. I remember when we were, uh, I was playing in Phoenix and uh, we had made a trade and he didn't really like the makeup of our team. And I walked in one day and he just looked down and Danny is the most upbeat, positive guy I've ever been around. And uh, he looked at me and said, I'm going to quit. He said, the joy's just, you know, not here for me. And he quit the next day. Wow. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, he took the Boston job. But Over the last couple of years, I don't know. I've seen the, I've just seen as a friend, you know, just Mm -hmm. kind of the grind uh, taking place. I know he's dying to spend more time with his grandkids, dying to play more golf. I don't know what he'll do next. Um, But yes, his decision to step down, um, I'm sure he'll, you know, his son Austin is there in Boston. I'm sure he'll, you know, help. uh, He's had a fantastic relationship with that ownership group. I'm sure he'll, He'll try to stay around and make sure they have everything that they need uh, so that they can go forward. And then hopefully we're going to get uh, Danny on the show here uh, in the next week or two. Wow, that'd be, that would be huge. Talk about questions. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. I'd start preparing now. Well, what do you think about Brad Stevens? Now, apparently he was kind of burnt out and is moving up, you know, into that executive role. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a big difference, but also I can understand the burnout of being there. What do you think? I think it's a a really good fit. Um, Brad and Danny, you know, Danny basically handpicked Brad. You know, he had a job opening when Doc Rivers left and he went to the best college coach he thought he could find that might be available. And he talked Brad into that. And they've worked hand in hand, really have over the last several years. So Brad knows he knows what to do, how to do it. And you can you know, he's just a he's a born leader. and I think, you know, this team with Brad had kind of hit a hit a place where maybe they need a little uh, a little shake up. I'm really excited and interested to see who they who they hire. Yeah, well, speaking of sort of burnout and, and a little connection, uh, I was just announced last week that um, Coach K is retiring <laughs> after 41. I guess it'll be 40. He's one more year, 42 years. Uh that's, um, that's gotta be a burnout. That's a, I can't imagine. He built that program from nothing. He is, will always forever be a legend there and stepping down. What do you think? What's your, what do you think about that? Who'd have thunk that within a year, coach K and Brad Stevens would be leaving coaching. Yeah, exactly. All right. And they faced off in 2010 of the tournament. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Something like that. the uh, 2010, old statesman and the and the new new basketball mind, and here they are uh, bowing out at the same time. I got to imagine I, Brad Stevens is going to coach again at some point. I hope so. Uh, he's so so great at it. Uh, but for Coach K, I love Coach K. I, I hate to see him. Uh, I hate to see him leaving. I think he's been unbelievable for the game, uh, not only for Duke players but for. Team USA and every, I mean, he's, he's been an ambassador for our sport for whatever it is now, 40 years. And uh, man, I'm, I'm going to miss him, but I'm going to take full advantage of watching him this year and every rocking chair he gets at every uh, ceremony. <laughs> yeah. Much deserved farewell tour from maybe the greatest to ever do it. 
My guy? Yeah. Oh, no question. You know what we you know who we have today? Who we have, Rex? We've got Tyrone Muggsy Bogues. <laughs> Tyrone uh, Curtis. Great friend Muggsy of Bogues. yours. Great friend, great friend of, of mine. yours. Long That's time right. teammate. Uh, yeah. A friend. I'm so excited. I'm excited for you to get to know Muggs. Uh, I know too. I've I've talked to you about him endlessly for years, but uh you'll see. What a what a what an interesting, smart, thoughtful, um, strong man. I, I'm just, I'm thrilled to death to call him my friend. We, you want to get to it? Let's get right to it. Let's get to Muggsy. All right. Tyrone Curtis Bogues, Muggs, Muggsy Bogues. What's up, Muggs? What's up, Scum? What's up, Rex? What's up, buddy? <laughs> Appreciate you guys. Good. Me on. Josh, meet Muggs. Muggs, meet Josh. Muggsy, big pleasure. I tell you, I've been friends with Rex for a while now. And every time he speaks of you, he lights up. He yeah. loves you. His face lights up. He tells great stories. He appreciates you as much as any teammate he's ever had. I know that. So it's a pleasure to finally get to talk to you. Well, same here, Josh. And it's vice versa. I mean, you know, the bond that we was able to you know, grow with one another, him, myself, and Dell. I mean, it's, it's nothing, you know, it's second to none, I should say. Um, it's just great when you got an opportunity to, you know, meet someone that connects and that you're able to, you know, share a lot of similarities with. How did that, real quick, jump in, how did that happen? I mean, you are from the Baltimore Lafayette Court Projects. He is from Owensboro, Kentucky, completely different upbringings, you know, mm -hmm. your bond was basketball, but what brought you two together as human beings coming from such different places? And what are your first impressions of one another? Well, for me, you know, of course, you know, I was in the league for a year, you know, playing with Washington and having to go through that year as a rookie, you know, got to understand what the NBA was, what was all about. And then coming to a new franchise, a new organization, which was Charlotte was, uh, myself mixed in with young players and combination with some older guys. Rex was one of the young players along with myself. And him and Dell, we just kind of gravitated to one another. Um, you know, basically, you know, just dialoguing. He knew we had families. Uh, he was a single guy. Um, and that kind of made it a little easier for him because we was more or less, you know, had that structure set up. And But it, it was just, the, you know, the connection. You know, Rex was the down to earth. Um, you know, he was very you know, highly, you know, uh, sought after because of, you know, his athleticism. And I just couldn't wait to play with a guy of that, that type of talent. So, I mean, that was something very easily to, you know, kind of gravi gravitate towards. What about you, Rex? Yeah, you know, well, see, I, I got to go back because I saw, I had seen Muggs play in high school. Um, I, I, you know, they, Baltimore Dunbar came to the famed, uh, King of the Bluegrass tournament in high school oh, yeah. and Muggsy's, you know, famed high school team, which had himself, uh, Reggie Lewis, David Wingate and Reggie Williams. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that, that may be the greatest high school team of all time, but I knew they were going to play and I had my dad take me down and, and watch in Louisville. And I was, you know, there's how old are you Muggs? F I'm 56, 56 now. 56. So I'm 53. I was only a year behind Muggsy in the league, but I was several years behind, you know, in actuality. Yeah, I had what, yeah. And I had watched him. Then I watched him play at Wake Forest where he just tore it up. So I was already a big fan. And then, you know, when I got to meet he and Dell and we all lived, you know, within one block of one another, <laughs> just by weird happenstance. Um, they just took me under their wing. You know, I was, I was too young, probably. I was 19, 20, and I really didn't. I was the youngest guy in the league, and I was I was happy to have a couple friends. You know, he had just had Brittany, his daughter. Um, she was born just before Stephen Curry, uh, Dell's son, and, you know, they were my little buddies. I would come over and hang out and play with the kids, and, and you know, Muggs and Dell really just taught me taught me how to be a pro and and – you know, we, we, uh, the great part about it for me was they, they were young and they hadn't been winning, uh, where they were. And we were all so competitive though. 
And, you know, we hated losing. It embarrassed <laughs> us kind of. We knew we had the greatest fans in the league, but we didn't win for them. We were raising banners every night, you know, or every year for um, attendance. But um, we couldn't we couldn't win for them. I was traded before they started winning. But, man, it was just I – was, I was fortunate to have mugs. Uh, I, I appreciate you like no other. And I played with great point guards, you know. In high school I had one. I played with you, and I, I'll say it. I'm sure I'll say it again in this in this episode. Muggs should be in the Hall of Fame. He really should. And, I, I you know, I hope that I'm around when that happens because I think it's going to happen. Nobody played the game like Muggs. Nobody. That's great. That's great. Muggs, let's talk about if we can start early because obviously your childhood, like everyone, shaped you so much. But you came from a tough, tough Maryland uh, Baltimore, uh, like how, how, how close was the wires depiction of, of Baltimore? <laughs> oh, it was right on. It was dead on. I um, mean, wow. that's the neighborhood that, you know, we grew up in and it was kind of, you know, it was both sides because we got East side and West side, uh, Baltimore, and pretty much it was similar. And the way they kind of described it in the, amongst the wire, how uh, they had, um, the drugs, taking place in the area, how they had the police more or less allowing things to take place. I mean, that was the culture, you know, that was something that we had to navigate around in order, you know, to make, to make sure we made it through that. You, I mean, you had siblings, culture, though, that didn't. You yeah. had siblings that didn't navigate it. Muggs, how did you stay away? Well, you know, my, my siblings, you know, fortunate enough for us, for me, that, you know, they didn't get into the negative trouble, but, you know, my brother played – for Dunbar, my sister played for Dunbar. Uh, I had an older brother, Chuck, who was more or less in the streets. Uh, mm -hmm. He was the one that wasn't athletic. So, but uh, having them and seeing them go through that, you know, th you knew that was something that you wanted for yourself, but more okay. or less, it was um, seeing, you know, your buddies, your friends, the guys in the neighborhood who was talented, you know, who was yeah. talented in a way where, you know, had the ability to, you had the skill set to go on and play at the highest level. But one able to stay focused enough in order to allow themselves to, to reach their full potential. But it's hard for people to understand. They see on the wire and TV, but you were shot when you were five. This is yeah. correct. I mean, do you remember that? I'm, I, five yeah. is awfully young to remember, but that's a traumatic moment. Do you remember it? Oh, absolutely. I remember. I mean, it was a, uh, you know, growing up in, in that atmosphere. I mean, you grew up early, you grew up quickly, I should say, you know, at the age of, Three years old, that's when I got my first basketball. And, you know, five years old, I'm able to, you know, go outside. And I, actually that day I snuck outside. I wasn't supposed to be out there. I'm um, out there and watching the sister play basketball. And all of a sudden the fight take place in the alley. And um, a window get busted. And old man Chester come running out of his store and went straight to his shed and grabbed his double barrel shotgun and saw the kids running through the neighborhood. He just start fine and... You know, the bullet missed out here, but the buck shots got all over me and woke up in the hospital with all these pellets all in your body and you're not knowing what was going to happen. But fortunate enough and thankful enough that God allowed me to get through it. And I think that allowed uh, something to happen in my mind. You know, wow. from that moment on, I didn't really care about what anyone said. You know, all the little small jokes that you used to hear out on the basketball court. You know, it doesn't. It just came in one end out the other. You know, yeah. after that, I believe after that incident, and it allowed me to really, just you know, not care about what anybody thought, and just really focus on more or less on myself. How did you? Uh, how, when did you learn growing up in that environment that you that the rest of the world wasn't like that? That you were one of the have-nots. Do you remember a moment where you're like, oh, my friends have? You know, do you remember a moment like that? Well, you know, I never looked at ourselves as the have nots, you know, in terms of what we didn't have. And, you know, my father, you know, he was a, he worked hard in the things that he tried to provide for his family, but, you know, got caught up in some negative things, got caught up for armed robbery and, and sent to prison for 12 years. And that devastated the entire family. You know, my mom only had 11th grade education at the time. So that was something which you, you know, witnessing that, you know, it, 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 it challenged you, you know, it, it sets your mindset saying that, you know, I want more for me and my family. And you know, hopefully one day I, I have a be in a position where we could change the, you know, the trajectory of, of our family. And that's where it all starts. You know, of course, the passion, 
and the dream and the vision that you have with the game of basketball allow you to continue to stay on that path and allow you to continue to grow. Uh, but, you know, we never looked upon as people on, up in the suburbs or people when we travel and played against other teams, what they had and what they didn't have. We was more or less worried about let's just go out here and beat their butts. <laughs> Mugs, um, that, you know, I've already learned a couple of things. I've known you for 30 years and I, I don't know that we've talked in depth about, you know, th this kind of stuff. Um, at what age? What at, you because you were a good, re really good wrestler, and I, I <laughs> saw you wrestle a couple of times in the locker room. Uh, um, at what age did you realize that you were well faster than everyone, but but really had had a gift for for sports because you played baseball? And I, I really want to know at what age you felt like damn, basketball is my shit. You know, this is what I can do. Well, you and, you know, the thing about it, playing all those sports, you, you're young, you know, because you just, those are just hobbies. Right. You, know, that you want to just continue to get yourself involved in. And as you're growing, you get 12 and 13 years old, you know, you and, and in our neighborhood, we was pretty known for basketball because myself and Reggie Wynn, we played ever since we were seven years old together. You know, and we had other guys in the neighborhood that was talented and we was winning and playing against other projects and neighborhoods, you know, and it was in all sports. It wasn't just in basketball yeah. <laughs> and, and baseball. And and then when I decided to wrestle, you know, that was a sport that came with no criteria. You know, it was either you was fast, strong, you know, you're good or you're not good. And that did you ever lose? I never lost. And yeah, I can't imagine you would I can't lose. Either. I mean, that you, Josh, I, people talk about it. I'm going to let you get back to it, Muggs, in a second. But people, you know, automatically thought they could just post Muggsy up. They just, you know, playing in the post. I couldn't. Muggsy was a way better post defender than I was. Uh, for real, for real. Like, because he had such good leverage. They couldn't get it, post him up deep. If it came deep, you know, yeah, get a little help. But he would get mad if we sent double teams because he didn't need them. Anyway, go ahead, Mug. Sorry. Yeah. And that is true. And but that's I mean, but wrestling was something that I think a lot of, especially my wrestling coach, really believed that I should have stayed in that industry, stayed in that area. Because he felt that wrestling could give me an opportunity to go to college and possibly, you know, make a better life for myself. But he didn't realize I had the same passion in the game of basketball and, you know, and what, what, what it came down to was high school, you know, the season ran into each other, you know, yeah. basketball and wrestling. And when I got sent to Southern high school and which wasn't, which was at the time was a zone school, you know, they was looking, taking people address, address, and they dictated that this is the school we need to go to because of the zone school. And which was crazy. Damn. Damn. Because we all lived in the projects. You know, I lived on Orleans Street. Reg lived on Central Avenue, which was just up the street around the corner. But we was all in the same, I don't even want to say it's a mile radius. <laughs> and they were splitting y'all up? And they split us up and sent us. They sent oh. Reggie to Clifton. They sent me to uh, Southern. They sent uh, David to Northern. Because Dunbar was a citywide school. It was a, a school where it was... You had to go there for a certain major, which was dental. And people, so we all decided to go to dental. But when it was time, Reggie got his transcript sent to Dunbar as well as David Wingate. But when it was time to get my transcript sent out, the coach, the coach down at Southern High School found out who I was and how good I was, and then the wrestling coach as well. So they kind of colluded a little bit and they hit my records. <laughs> and uh and I had to stay there for a whole year. You know, you got to be kidding that's me. Why, that's why I, that I wasn't at Dunbar my my uh, sophomore that's year. That's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, I was so, going to ask you why, how your dream of being a dental hygienist, uh, <laughs> influence, your childhood dream influenced your basketball career. <laughs> Go ahead and tell them how that happened. <laughs> then I became very interested in dentists. <laughs> You know, I, I want to learn about all about the molars and you know, <laughs> that you can kind of create. And, but, you know, seriously, you know, my records came about, this was after, but it was after too late to transfer. And, you know, Dunbar went on and they played. And of course, they lost, I think, 
three games that year. Uh, and they felt like if I was there, of course, if I was there, we wouldn't have never lost a game, which following year I got there, we didn't lose a game. My, my, my junior and senior year, we was 59 and 0. Um, That's absurd, man. I mean, 59 and 0. Yeah. Did, but how, let me ask this, Muggs. Did you, did, uh, did you know, I mean, I'm sure you were the one that that they thought had the least chance of going on and, you know, may, being a pro. But did you know, because and at the time, Reggie Lewis was not like he became right. He would kind of came off the bench at first, maybe. And and but did you know that they were pros or uh, did, had you seen enough pros by that time? Well, you know, I knew what I really did know is that we had a really high skill set. And that our IQ level was really high. That mm-hmm. the fundamentals of the game of basketball for us was understood early on. And we was allowed to let our natural athletic talent just continue to grow. I think, and that's where, where I saw it in terms of the separation of what we've seen around the city. You know, teams of who you played against and players that you played against. You know, you saw that. And Reggie mm-hmm. Lewis, again, Reg could have started on, he could have started yeah. for us. Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, but coach, you know, coach was one of those coaches who broke those egos down once you walk in the door and he made it to Reg and made them understood that, you know, coming out being that six man because him and Reggie Williams, they was murderers. Yeah, they were kind of alike. Yeah, it really was. And Reggie Lewis skill set was that high and people didn't understand that. And uh, when Reg, because he came off the bench, but, you know, we knew that and everybody else knew that. But, you know, I knew that. Once we all decided where we would go, you know, as far as college-wise, that, you know, possibly we have a way of possibly making it all the way if we all stay focused. Do you want to get an advantage over the sports books during the NBA and NHL playoffs? How about an inside edge this MLB season? Then download BetQL, the only app you'll need to make smart bets. Their best bets algorithm scans over 350,000 bets per year to give you a best bet recommendation for every game across all major sports and gives you the reasoning behind why you should place the bet. BetQL also has tons of other tools like sharp data so you can see who the pros are backing and line movement so you can jump on betting opportunities in real time. Plus, you can save all your picks in one place to track your success and winning streaks, as well as view your rank on their leaderboards. Head to the App Store or Google Play Store now to download BetQL. You can also head to try.betql.co backslash Rex. Enter the discount code Rex at payment checkout for 25% off of their subscription offerings. Don't miss out on the chance to beat the book this summer i've never asked you um so with gate david wingate and reggie go to georgetown mm-hmm. which is right, right there mm-hmm. um w- did you did big john recruit you why didn't you go to georgetown and how did you end up at wake well the truth of that um myself and reggie lois we all could have went to georgetown but, you know, at the time, they had Michael Jackson was only a sophomore yep. coming off, and he was young. And, you know, and, and, and for me, you know, I had other schools coming after me as well as Reg. And mm-hmm. I looked at the situation in terms of, you know, and I was always secure with me. And I uh, didn't need no reason I need to follow anybody. So I just looked at the best situation and felt like, you know, wake, and it was, came down to Seton Hall as well. Um, but Wake was a better opportunity for me on and off the court academically as well as a challenge on the basketball court. And plus, it was one of the toughest conferences at the time, you know, that moms could really just turn on TV every Saturday and, and, and turn on. She had to worry about it. So those, that decision was something that I kind of looked at and took it very, you know, heartfully and, uh, and made that decision. I think it turned out to be the best. I mean, ever since I was a kid, I've people have talked about, the Dunbar Poets and your team as the best high school team of all time. And now this is, people need to understand, this is not like now where they recruit nationally and AAU teams and these teams where kids go into high school in Arizona one year and then he goes to another school. It, this is, they were all from the same neighborhood. This yeah. was real and unique to the time. I mean, you had 
four NBA players on your team, three first round draft picks. Uh, maybe I read somewhere this 11 D one players mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. team, 11 <laughs> D one players on the team. That's, it's unbelievable. What did you guys realize then? You knew you were great, but did you know you were all time great high school team? Well, you know, we we was in it. We weren't looking at that. We were just out there trying to, you know, make a name for ourselves and whichever component that was we was faced with, we wanted to take them down. Uh, because, you know, as kids, you know, that's what it was, you know, trying to grab it, you know, get that reputation. And for me, you know, every time we went out there, of course, you know, at the beginning, the people laughed, and but after it was over with, you know, they stood up and cheered. And uh, that's those great. Things that uh, you know, you always kind of remember. Yeah, man. Um, you know what I forgot? I forgot that you played a year in the USBL. <laughs> How and why? I don't. I mean, I don't know. I, when I was, uh, I was looking at, you know. Brushing up on some of your history uh, past few days, and I went, "Oh shit, he played it! I forgot he played it USBL." Yeah, you were the second overall pick in the draft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, it was just before the NBA draft because it happened <laughs> uh, right after school, right after your college season is over. And for me, it was a lead that had a lot of former NBA players. Yeah. A lot of players that played in the league and some guys that was trying to get back into the league, you know, they had the likes of the Manute Bowes, but Webb, uh, World Be Free, Michael Ray Richardson. So, you know, speaking with the agent, David Faulkner, you know, and, and it was only for a month. So I decided to go ahead and play. And plus, you made a few thousand, made money doing it. As were, you, were, you trying to, were you trying to raise your draft stock? I mean, was this before the draft or after the draft, Mug? Well, my draft stock was pretty much already there because, you know, okay. the combine, you know, and yeah. all that. And I pretty much did my thing there. It was just me okay. in shape. Um, you know, the, the for me, I just wanted to play against pros. You know, yeah. some pros and just to get out there and see what it was all about and didn't care about what, you know, what would what, what really matter. Uh, and actually, the draft had not taken place yet. Um, and then what happened, because the thing about it, before the draft, because I twisted my ankle, that's why I stopped. Before okay. I want to make sure that the draft, you know, didn't. But you were, you were averaging like 20 some. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was, yeah, it was one of those things. Because, you know, college, you know, you, you feel like the, seemed like the NBA, the court got a little wider. Yeah. You know, it was a lot more space. And, and, and you know, you felt a little more, this, this was suited for you. Yeah. And uh, and it really prepared me to go get ready for the, uh, the the draft up in Chicago, you know where me and Scotty really tore it up there, and that's where the last impressions with the coaches and the GMs and everybody get a chance to watch. Well, you obviously have an unbelievable uh, uh, belief in yourself and confidence, and you had to develop that early. Where you're from, uh, your size. Was there ever any doubt in your mind? going to the NBA that this was, that you weren't going to make it. I mean, I read you were 16 and a half inches shorter than the average player in the NBA, not like Manute Bull, not like the centers, than the average player. Were you ever like, I, I just don't know if I can do this. No, I never had no doubt <laughs> in my mind. I mean, I was, you know, I was that type of guy that just believed in me and just couldn't wait to play against whoever felt like they was the best point guard or whoever the best guard. And I wanted to show them that, you know, a guy my size was capable as well. And the thing that I always took on the floor is that if you play, you know, you play against the best, you have success against the best, you need to be included with the best. You know, and having that understanding, you know, every time I took the court, that was something that I understood and I challenged. And, you know, it, it was a, just a means of just trying to, you know, showcase, you know, my skill set, how I can impact the game you know, at the size that I am, you know, we had the six, nine point guard and the magic Johnsons and, you know, those type of way, how they impact the game. Tiny Archibald was only C was six, one. He wasn't too tiny to me. Um, so <laughs> those guys, you know, they impact the game in a different way. So, you know, as well as Spud Webb and the Michael Adams, and here it is a guy my size, you know, we just played the game totally different. And the way I did, you know, I, I played it more as a true point guard as in terms of being able to, you know, run your team and make guys run you better. And at the same time, they have to get yours off. 
but having that understanding, making your point guard, get the ball, work across half court, you know, before you get into the offense, because you knew that's where it all started. You know, so that understanding, that knowledge allowed me to always continue to believe in me. It's really a, a the entire life lesson. And because life, as we've, it's a, we've talked about on this podcast before, everyone's greatest strength is also their susceptible point, their, their weakness. And when did you know for sure that your supposed weakness was going to be your strength and you knew you were going to impact the game because of your size, not in spite of it? Well, it wasn't one uh, particular moment. It was just the, just the process, the progress. I mean, each level that you, you know, you played on, you, you know, it started from elementary to middle school. Well, we didn't have middle school, junior high school to high school to college, you know, and then once you get to that part in the college and, you know, you get to, that's the next step is the last step is the NBA, you know, and having success playing against some of the top guards in the, you know, in your conference and in the country, I should say. And then, then having the opportunity to, to represent the USA, you know, basketball team, you know, as a collegiate basketball player and being the last collegiate team that won the gold medal. I mean, you knew that you was on the right path and I knew I was putting myself in a good situation. And it was just a matter of uh, taking advantage of all the opportunities that came my way. And when they did, you know, that's what I, you know, kind of took advantage of. I think people don't understand, um, I, you know, again, I, I did get to play with really good point guards. I went down to, you know, I played with Skiles and, and I played with Michael Adams and I played with Tim Hardaway and Jason Kidd. And I've said it before, Muggs really was like playing with Jason. He, Muggs was a 5'3 Jason Kidd. He could rebound. He would just look to push it and pass out sugar. That was it. And I used to get mad and we used to get mad at Muggs because he would pass up shots. You know, he would have and there was wasn't a better, you know, 16, 17 foot jump shooter than Muggsy Bogues. And if we played today, he'd have been a three point shooter, too, you know, because he would have evolved into that. But people don't under quite understand. I, I mean, when he and I played together, I can only remember like two point guards, maybe that we might game plan different for. I might like if we guard if we played the Lakers, I might guard Magic. You, mm -hmm. you might guard Byron. If mm -hmm. we played, if we played New York, I might guard Mark Jackson because Mark was really good in the post and I just gave him a little bit more size. I'm trying to think back. What were the guys you remember that get kind of, you were, gave you some, some problems. I come into my mind. I can't, how, how did you fare against Mookie Blaylock? Oh, I played well against Mookie. Mookie was a, you know, these the, the, the good, they hate seeing me because I was a different type. <laughs> <laughs> yes, guys they did. Guys just hate playing against me. But for me, you know, it wasn't that much different. And um, only two guys that was more or less like the Magic and Mark Jackson because they was more of a pass. They they, they want to get in the post to pass. To pass. Over the score. And, you know, and I had understanding that, you know, point guards, they didn't know how to play with that back towards the basket. Right. You know, more of a, we were like, sure, go ahead, po post your point guard up if you want. You're not that way. You're not throwing it into Hakeem or right. Patrick or whoever else. Absolutely, but guys like Mark and Magic and, pa and Penny Hardaway has times too. Yeah, they like to, you know, those are the guys that want to pass to where you know, and that's where I kind of get a little frustrated when guys come down to help because I know that's the situation in terms of what you know, make them score. They score, yeah. they score. You know, but yeah. I know that ain't the reason. That ain't their strength of down there scoring it, and it takes away from other guys. So that's what kind of things, you know, those guys like that. And a guy like Mark Price, again, you know, Mark Price, because I like to gamble, you yeah. know. I like to help off my man a lot. And it was, it's hard to leave a guy like him, you know, because he met Steph Curry before Steph was out there shoot the lights out. So a guy like Mark Price, you know, you, 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 you hate playing this guy like because you cannot leave him at one yeah. point. At all, you know, you pretty much got to stay with Mark at all times. Damn, that's just so it's so much fun to talk about. I, I, I uh, in high school, how, uh, how, how many times a game would you pick the guy and just go lay it in in the backcourt? 
mean, I mean, high school was really easy because you know I average eight <laughs> in high school. Can't imagine. You know, I average eight steals, eight points, and eight assists eight in high steals. school. Yeah, and that, and it was because you know God's one thing I like to set you up, and you know the dribble. I dribble. You know, everybody and, dribbles too high for Muggsy. We ask him every game, Muggs, tell us about who you're playing against tonight. It, it didn't matter. Magic, John Stockton, if he's got a high dribble. <laughs> Wait, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you always understand. It. And then for me, you know, I, and guys didn't realize how I used to let guys go in front of me and think that they beat me or some sort, but. That's defense I'm playing behind you, and and I've had so many steals like that, and, you know, guys kind of – and then when they got aware of it, you know, of course they start looking, and that Mm -hmm. also takes away from getting into your offense. So, you know, I did a lot of things allowed me to stay on the floor and be out there, you know, know, and I averaged 30-some minutes, you know. It was – Yeah, never uh, got tired. That's the other thing. And, Josh, I I think that, you know – People listening to this will now get it, and people who followed Muggsy, they definitely get it. Um, Muggs, yes, he plays played at five three in the NBA, but not not because or in spite of that. Knows the game as well as anybody I've ever been around. You know, as a rookie coming in, he was teaching me out there at the same time. He's telling me where to go. He's pointing where knew everybody's position knew what they were supposed to do on their cut, dummy cut, regular cut, scoring cut. Uh, one of the best basketball minds that, you know, as you can tell, so thoughtful and attention to detail, just a dream to play with. A yeah, and, and I mean, you had to have that too. I mean, playing with – and for me, you know, ha- having that understanding of uh, where a player like the basketball and how to put him in a position to be successful, you know, as opposed to putting him in a position where he's uncomfortable. You know, I always had a good knack for that. And that's the chemistry that we always was able to, you know, form with one another, you know, because everybody understood their roles. And for me, you know, I knew trying to be a five, three point guard, trying to go out there and score 30 points and 20 points every night. I mean, that just didn't make sense for me. And it didn't probably wouldn't make sense for anybody. And that's where the understanding for me always came from at an early point, playing with guys like the Reggie Williams, the late Reggie Lewis and, David Wingate, you know, talent to where talent can really compensate one another. And, uh, and having that understanding, you know, it allowed me to really, you know, explore that game. Was uh, speaking, go, was Skip Wise on your high school team? Is no, he-, he wasn't on my high school team. He was, he was. you know, he was out idle in the neighborhood. Oh, honey dip. You know, I spoke to him about a month ago. Uh, he's, you know, he was our guy. You know, the dipper was our guy, the one that really the first one that made it, that got that opportunity, you know, even though his he had some his downfalls, but he was the one that always more or less, you know, inspired us to be what we can be. And uh and, and, and witnessing that and saying that, you know, gave us uh, you know, some hope that we can possibly be that one day. Is he the best player that you remember that didn't make it? Oh, absolutely. Honey Dip is the best player that I've that I've witnessed and that I've seen in quite some time who didn't get the, the roses that he should have. Wow. He now now he had drug problems, correct? Well, it wasn't people want to label that that he had drug problems, but that ain't right. the reason why Golden State got rid of him. I mean, Golden State got rid of him that year because uh, I mean at the time he was home and his girl was pregnant and they had the top score on the lead and all that. So they had to make a decision who to keep one. And they decided to keep the top score. And, you know, of course he had his downfall with some problems with that, but that wasn't the reason. Wow. Uh, all right. Take yourself out of it. Take Reggie out to both Reggie's Reggie Lewis, Reggie Williams, and David Wingate. Who, who are the top five uh, players out of Baltimore all time? Baltimore, DC, the whole Baltimore, DC. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Baltimore area. DC. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Uh, oh no, let's just go straight Baltimore. Okay. okay straight Baltimore. Okay. okay. Well, Baltimore, we're gonna go, I'm gonna go skip wise. You know, we're gonna go skip wise. Cause skip honey that was was something special. People don't remember Larry Gibson. Right. You know, Larry Gibson used to be at Maryland. Yeah. He was something very special. And then people probably forgot about Ernest Graham. Oh, no. 
Ernie, Ernie G. Graham. Ernie went to Maryland. Should have <laughs> been on boss, but, you know, because of attitude and so forth that he was something that, you know, I guess that didn't allow him to, 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 mm. to, to, to see his fruition come true. Then there was another little guy that who I admired, who really allowed me to be who be me. And his really? name, Dwayne Woods. They called him Co. Okay. Cole would have been the first small NBA player if he would have made the right decision. If he would have went to Georgia and played with Dominique Wilkins, as mm -hmm. opposed to going down to Virginia State, which was a smaller college yep. playing boy. Uh, Duke, Kevin Bush, because and Cole was 5'5", five, five, shoot the lights out. He had a jump shot that it went, I mean, shoot. The really? Defense. He played the type of defense I played, but I played just a little more aggressive, but he had the same type of uh, passing ability and the, and the IQ level because we was taught by the same man, by Mr. Howard in our neighborhood. And, and that's what I say. And I always talk about this every time I have an opportunity. He would have been the one before I even would have even got there if he would have made that decision to go to Georgia. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And well, then in PCR, you know, they had the Adrian Dantley's and Yeah. You know, of course, uh, oh, let me let these dogs out. <laughs> <laughs> Who let them out? Mugs, Who, let, the mugs let the dogs out. <laughs> hey, well, what about real quick? Let's talk about today's NBA. You two talk about it. What just the game today? Who do you love to watch play? Uh, where do you think the game goes next? What do you think about these playoffs? Well, we love the game. I mean, the game has evolved, especially from the time that we played. I mean, you know, they always say that the old guys hating on the game. You know, hmm. we're not hating on the game. It's just a different game and it's involved that we, you know, we embrace this type of game because it's, you know, it's, a lot of scoring, uh, less less physical defenses, I should say, that take place out there. Um, but the skill set has changed. You know, you got guys that seven foot bring the basketball up the court, you know, shooting threes where, you know, seven footers was playing with their back towards the basket in our era. Um, so, um, you know, we got to love it in that case. But, you know, you lo I love the players. You know, it ain't one specific player. Of course, I'm biased with Stefan. Stefan. Steph is, you know, something that is some, you know, is real dear to us. You know, and of course, I like the likings of the Chris Pauls and those guys out there at Westbrooks. But, um, you know, the game it is, and, you know, the teams are now. Um, people thinking that the Lakers, you know, they're in trouble, which I think they are too. You know, Brooklyn mm -hmm. looking good. But for some reason, I think Milwaukee, it could be their year. You know, it could be Milwaukee's year this year. And um, so we'll see. Hey, Muggs, what do you think about Dame Lillard? Say, D. Lillard is something special. You know, he really something special. I mean, he is another Steph Curry. Uh, Steph just moved differently than, than than Dame in terms of once they get the basketball up. Uh, but Dame, is a, he's a killer. Uh, I don't understand why they wasn't double teaming him. <laughs> <laughs> Agree. <laughs> and not only that, and I'm still, tendencies don't change. And I'm, as a guard, I'll be watching, and I'm like, why are they – the, why are they not playing him a certain way? Yeah, getting playing him individually. You know, it's certain things that you play. You play. could do that though, Muggs, because it, think about it. If mm -hmm. if that could be done right now, people would be doing it. You could do that. That was a specialty that you had. You could get up under a guy like Dame Lillard. You know, it, most people can't. Yeah, but it's it's not so much getting up underneath him, but he has a his step back is always step to the right left to the right so why not make him step to the left okay make him step to the left if that's i mean it's every time you come back is a step to the right it's just the same move okay. you're the only guy in the world that can guard it i'm sorry you I mean, nobody else can guard it but you you're the yeah. only person <laughs> it's just a matter of, it's just a matter of them looking at them details and tendencies that guys don't change it's, and that's what my bottom with some of these guys when they play a certain player, players they don't they don't take away the tendencies that they really love to stay with. And for me, Mark Price, I used to try to take away. I know he wanted to just shoot the ball. I know he needed, but he, I don't give him space. You know what I'm saying? I make him do something, I give him space. So now, you know, he he not worried about trying to run and get the ball. He's, you know, he's in the flow. So you take a man, you know, take a little tendencies away and you slow that down. You ain't going to take away everything, but right. you slow it down to a way to where – 
you know, to God, I got to think about another way of getting it out. Hey, Muggs, did you, did ever, you ever go ahead? Go ahead, go, go ahead, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, please. Muggs, did, did you ever have a, a coach in the league? Not your coach, but was there a coach that ever just tried to that he was just going to try to post you up all night long, or he that just didn't like you being out there and was going to try to get you out of the game? Well, uh, I will, I won't say it just was just a coach that was constantly it was because of the player, but I think. They felt like, you know, especially when Tim Holloway was trying to thought they had Tim was yeah. <laughs> but he was posting up bigger players though. So they yeah. felt like he was posting up bigger players that he can just try to post me up down there. And, and it wasn't happening, it wasn't working. So you know, Nelly realized, you know, ain't no need to keep trying to go down there and keep doing it. Let's keep Tim was, going. Uh, was that Pat? And, and and Pat Pat tried it with uh with uh Steve when Steve Smith was with him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when Smith was with Steve was with and, and then Smitty got to the point where he like, man, I'm shit, yeah, I'm done with this. Well, you yeah, this Smitty's legs, you could just root Smitty out. He ended up catching it at 17 feet. Yeah, because you know people realize how strong I put that form in your back. I know and you couldn't move me back, you know, because no. I was a little strong in, in regards, had some nice strong legs. Um, so, you know, having that understanding and, you know, that's that's what it was. Is there any like, do you remember, because you're obviously such a student of the game, do you remember some of the tendencies of other point guards at the time? Like you were going to have to like get up on his left hand or you knew he didn't like physical or you knew if you gave him space, he didn't know what to do with it. Any oh, tendencies I, of some of the greats in? Oh, I know. Yeah, I knew every tendency of every point guard that I played against. I mean, all the way from Kevin Johnson, you know, Kev. He wanted to drill with his right, put the ball between his legs, and give you that little hesitation move with his left hand. You know, get to the <laughs> and back. if he looked, and if he looked down, he was going to jump up and shoot it. Going to jump up and shoot, yeah. <laughs> so you know those type of things like that. You know, and from I mean, you go from Isaiah Thomas. You know, those everybody had those tendencies that they had. You know, so you know, you I noticed them. Every time, I and, that, that was, and that was, that's what we would do. That's what we would do. That was kind of the old timey way of of mm -hmm. scouting. We watched right. very little film at first, but whoever you were going to guard, like even if it was a, if I was coming off the bench, I would know the backup on the bench, and they would come to me before the game. Coaches would be like, "Rex, tell me about you know uh, such and such." I would tell them that that person's tendencies. If you didn't know the person's tendencies that you were asked about, you're going to be in trouble. So you better know everybody's tendency, right? That is true. Yeah. Well, you had a, a encyclopedia of tendencies playing with you, so you could always go to Muggsy and go, "What about this? What I do?" I'm sure you learned a lot of a lot of that from Muggsy. No question. Um, yeah, I I knew based on the level of how, how serious Muggs and Dell took our pregame preparation, pregame notes, and all that stuff, there was no chance that I was ever going to go into a game and not know what was going on or what the game plan was because they were so conscientious. Uh, Muggs, I know I don't want to keep you much longer, but I do want to ask a couple more th things. I know Josh has a couple more questions. Um, you, did you know, because we were all with David Falk, did you know that I was supposed to be in Space Jam also? But that was a summer that I had broken my shin. Do you remember that? Really? You were supposed to be? You know, it, you, that was the summer <laughs> you broke your shin. And that was the summer I had surgery on my knee. Yeah, I know. I, you know <laughs> and I was in a cast. And, 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 and I was on crutches. <laughs> And the thing about it, I wasn't supposed because once they found out, they said, well, you know, with mugs, you on you know, crutches. They said, well, because they were going to have Tim Hardaway come and do my. Oh, no way. Yeah, they had Tim Hardaway come in there and fill in. So, but they said, well, just come and just come and read the line. Just come and read it anywhere. We'll see how it did. And when I got there, you know, and I was doing my lines and everything. So they decided, okay, well, they created these little opportunities where I had to walk. They had me pull them on the dolly. So great. They wouldn't do that for me. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't participate in some of those legendary, they say, games, the pickup games uh, I during watched, that? I, I had to sit on the sideline because I had, I was on crutches. You know, as you notice, you know, when I was walking to the middle of the, the little seance where they was, we had to touch the ball, I was I had a little limp I because I didn't walk that far. Yeah. I had my crutches and I took my crutches off and I kind of, they had me 
take about two steps when I was right there. Because I just uh, had surgery on my knee. Did that had to kill you, A, to watch those games? And B, do you remember anything uh, in particular from them? Well, a lot of trash talking went on. Uh, I, I, and not only that, but it was the ambiance in it. You know, he had, they had a big tent, an air conditioner tent built for Michael with a uh, with, I don't know, was it UCLA, the actual court that they brought over or, yeah. uh, from Pepperdine, one of the guys, they brought the actual court over. Wow. <laughs> he, had driving, he had a driving range little area where he could hit the <laughs> ball and all the weights in there where he can lift. I mean, it was unreal in there, man. The guys, Reggie Miller, all those guys that come over and play pickup game. It used to be some good trash talking going on over there. Oh, I imagine. Yeah. I think people don't understand, you know, Muggs, you, you can fill them in how – well, because Michael, well, and all you and I were both with David Falk and Michael was with David, but, but we knew Michael differently than most everybody else due to his affiliation with the Carolinas, his parents, his dad, they came to all of our games. You know, yeah. of course they'd come when Michael was there, but they were at all of our Hornets home games and we would hang really? out I with Larry. That. We yeah. would hang out with Larry and, and yeah. Michael's mom and dad and Roslyn and, and his brother um, but yeah, let people know how kind of how that was back then, Muggs. It really was. I mean, Mr. Jordan and Mama Jordan, they was the true Hornet fans. I mean, they loved MJ and of course supported them when he came, but they were supporting us against everybody else. I mean, they was true Hornet fans. They really loved the city, loved the Hornets and what it all meant. And uh, and seeing them out there, you know, being part of it, it always made it special. Of course, you had MJ come through and now uh, being uh, owner of the team here, it, it just it just makes it even that much special um, because I mean we had so many crazy fans. I mean twenty four screaming thousand, uh, twenty four thousand fans night on a nightly basis. And I mean, again, we wasn't winning at the time. And then and Rush and I, we were so young and we was hungry. But getting the opportunity to kind of you know experience that and grow with the city as well with you know the Jordan and them being part of it, it was special. What uh, a, a much maligned player that doesn't get talked about enough because he got hurt in, in his career. But what was it like to play with 100% primetime Larry Johnson? I mean, Al was special. I mean, before he got hurt, he was something uh, that size that, you know, of course, Charles Barkley was the closest thing to it. But he had so much explosiveness with him. I mean, that came out uh, UNLV with his swagger, with his attitude. I mean, he had – a powerful uh, uh, in terms of when he dunked the basketball, it was, it was very forceful. But he had the personnel <laughs> to go along with it. That's what was that's what was great about it. I mean, he was not a guy that was stuck on himself. He, he loved his teammates. He loved the city. Um, you know, he was a winner, and he just wanted to win. You know, playing with a guy like him and then acquiring Alonzo. I mean, it was truly, truly special. I wish we could have had Rex with that crew because I tell you what, but that had been something special. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I know we're winding down. Uh, one real quick thing. Uh, this is more of a story. We had Dell and Steph on. And uh, I love to tell them a story Rex used to tell about how since you guys live real close and you were like me and Muggs and Dell thought we were hot shit, NBA players and whatnot. We get in the car and it turns out the best player was strapped into a car seat behind us. In the back. <laughs> That's so true. That is it. I mean, the best player was strapped in the car. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's amazing to see that though. I mean, Dallas, I, I mean, deserves so much credit in raising the kids and how they was able to turn out because again, you know, no one thought Stefan could be the player he is. They didn't even give him a chance. Virginia Tech won the red shirt him. And uh, here it is. He was not small in stature, but small in 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 weight and in, in, in that suit in that scenario where they looked at him as small, you know, but he always had an understanding how small guys can overcome. And um, and when he ever got his opportunity, you saw he just just uh, took advantage of it and relished of it. And he I'm sure. Well, he's I'm the greatest sure. shooter in the world in the game of yeah. basketball. Ever. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm sure Dell more than once said, hey, Muggsy had to do And Muggsy, and Muggsy, I bet he brought you up a million times when he was talking to Steph about overcoming size and, skip, and making the game your own. So I'm sure you had a lot to do with that. Well, he was witnessing. He was right there watching it yeah. on his own, you know, as a young kid. I mean, 
uh, we had so many moments together with him and our kids and him being around the game and uh, maybe just a little sponge just soaking it all up. Mm. Muggs, uh, what's your favorite movie? Space Jam. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. There you yeah. go. Residuals are not bad. <laughs> <laughs> You were you. What about a TV? You were in a, a classic scene yeah. episode of Larry David. Oh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Played the perfect role too. They had the perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you played you. So yeah, that was pretty much uh, perfect yeah. casting. Yeah, you want to was... tell exactly kind of what happened in the scene because it's really well, funny. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. I, they they got the perfect guy for that scene. Um, it was Richard Lewis who was uh, curious about. You know, he now dating this former athlete and he was kind of concerned about have to follow a former athlete. And he always imagined that, you know, athletes are gigantic in terms of their size and their their, their, their private area. So he was like, I can't follow no I mean, what it looked like. And here it is. We happened to be in the bath in the restroom and they decide they want to try to take a peek and see what it looked like. And I just happened to catch Larry looking over, and you know, I kind of went off on him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is that's a classic scene of a classic show. You've been in classic movies and shows. Amazing, an amazing career all the way around, especially from the beginnings. We're so much stacked against you, man. You're a real inspiration. I appreciate you guys, man. Thanks for having me, Scumza. It's always treat to catch up with you, my brother. I tell you, and then you, you guys, you know, with the show you guys doing on sort of this platform, you're reaching a lot of folks, and I'm grateful to be on it. Man, I Thanks, love you. Man. You know I love you. Um, you've always been there for me, highs and lows. And uh, I know everything that you've done for your family, Mugs, and I, I know where you came from. I've been there, been there with you. And um, you uh, you inspire so many people and 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 – with your life and it's not just sports it's the it transcends sports i love you buddy love you big fella appreciate you man Always. all right man, all right, man. hey monty right. front row center to watch any band any speaker any player dead or alive front row center you get to be there who do you who's that it's michael jackson oh okay okay we got enough what's two michael jacksons we've got that's, that's, that's great. A, that is that is all right mugs all right, thanks buddy you. okay all right job Thank you so much, Moxie. You're welcome, guys. Thanks, man. I'll hit you later. Okay, buddy. Well, Josh, that's Muggs. Yeah. Wow, he did not disappoint. That, you know what's great about that, and, and it's true with all these guys that played with you. Everyone on here is here because they really love you, Rex, and they admire oh. you. And, and yes, and I know you hate getting compliments, but it's true. And those guys that you really played with for a long time, the, the, the camaraderie, the uh, respect and the lifelong bond and love they have for you and you for them is is really fun to see, man. And it's testament to you and them. And thanks for letting me be a part of watching that because you two obviously really, really love one another. Oh, that's really sweet, Josh. It, it really is. I, I feel so fortunate to have friends like Dell and Muggs and, and you, uh, I mean, lifers. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, life is hard. It's hard for all of us. And Muggs, you know, uh, we didn't get into it. Muggs was married to Kim, his his wife forever, from the time they're young. And they got divorced in the 90s. And they got back together about five years ago, remarried. <laughs> and just straight. And, and, and I just mean to tell you that we were all young and dumb and just running wild at one point. And it's so fun to see you know, Muggs, who comes from Baltimore, comes from the hood. And he went to Wake Forest, spent four years, went back, got his degree, um, went on and played forever in the NBA. But Charlotte, North Carolina became his home. And his family's there with him. His older brother, Chuck, who's had serious drug problems his whole life, lives with Muggs, been off hardcore drugs for years. 20 some years 20 now years, yeah. and wow. uh he's taking care of his family he and he, i'm telling you 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 saw you can see what his brain is like there you know yeah. mugs is wasn't just some little fast guy running around out there mindlessly there's a oh, reason he played for as long have been as he there did. if he wasn't that cerebral if he yeah, had so, to be like you know peyton Man. 
Omaha, Omaha. He right, had to right. know everything going on, and he right. obviously and did. He did. He's a Hall of Famer to me. He's a Hall of Famer. Nobody will Always ever do that. at his size what he's been able to do. He, you know, and he was a real point guard. Today, I, I don't know how they would guard him because he would be able to shoot, and then he would just shoot layups because there's nobody at the basket anymore. <laughs> Right. And yeah. they couldn't they couldn't hold on to him to stop. No, him. no. You know, he's anyway. so strong. How fortunate are you to, have, you know, played, especially early with one of the great all time minds and just anomalies of the NBA in Muggsy, one of the greatest shooters ever in Dell. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you're friends with the greatest inbounder that's ever touch the basketball that's, that's gotta, true what's that like for you just feel you just feel blessed well yeah I mean the other the guys you know that you mentioned the Muggsies the you know the Jason kids those guys they're fine but inbounding as you well know I mean you you kind of wrote the book on it uh it's a specialty and nobody does it like you do it Josh well you. tell since you said it the book is called inbounding uh my life from Going outside to inside uh, by Josh Hopkins, and it's it's it teaches a lot about the nuances of inbounding, but also about how to inbound in your life. You know. Oh wow! So it's yeah. kind of a self self help book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we all see times where we need to inbound. Yeah. By the way, you had did you read anything this week? Uh, actually, I didn't, but um, next week I'm planning on it. Yeah. Has this been book okay. club. What about you? This I didn't. I didn't. Ah, this has been, okay. this well, has been book club. club. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, hey, great app, man. Thanks for including me. Thanks for all the good Muggsy questions. I learned I learned two or three things today about Muggs that I didn't know, and I've known him for 30 years. So, guys, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on the Rex Chapman Show with Super Josh Hopkins, brought to you, powered by basketballnews.com. Subscribe, rate, and review. We'll see you next week.